uh, it's a fun opportunity to be here to talk to you today about waveform systematics. Um, so I'm really going to be focused on binary black holes. Um, as Patricia alluded to, Rosella will be really be focused on binary neutron stars. Um, so I'll really be talking about the, the point particle limit. Um, this talk was actually kind of difficult to write because I realized that our knowledge of waveform systematics um, is actually pretty poorly understood, especially with the latest generation of model where we included things like precession and high multipoles. Um, so recent LIGO papers are really the first time that we started to do this on a large scale. Um, so this made the, the talk somewhat tedious to write. Now, as Patricia was alluding to, precision measurements of binary parameters really re requires exquisitely accurate wafer models that are computationally efficient. Um, we're now reaching the point where we have tens or hundreds of binary black holes that we want to analyze, especially if we want to consider things like sub-threshold triggers as well. Um, so this, this computational efficiency actually is important. You need to get as much physical information into your wafer models in a, a nice compact form. Now, missing physics or inaccurate wafer models will actually induce systematic biases. Um, these are errors just from our poor modeling or, or a lack of physics. This is parameter shifts and similar. Now, whilst this can be problematic for individual events, um, so we saw with 1905-21, for instance, yesterday, this can also be potentially catastrophic for populations of astrophysical black holes. Now, for instance, if we have this ambitious goal of me measuring the relative branching ratio between different formation channels to the percent level, then we really need to disentangle effects like precession or even things like chi-effective. Is chi-effective positive, negative? Do we have precession in the system? Is it asymmetric, et cetera? And this requires a tight control of waveform systematics. Likewise, there's things such as a misidentification of a binary neutron star, NSBH, VBH. What is the component mass of the smaller um, object in the system? This is something where you, again, need accurate waveform models to really sort of distinguish between these two, especially for systems that start approaching the boundary where we think we have the maximum neutron star mass. Um, as I'm sure we'll hear in Rosella's talk, we also need to disentangle the point particles. This is the, the vacuum binary black hole so waveform effects from, from matter effects. This means, again, a tight control uh, of your binary black hole waveform models. Other things, such as accurate sky localization, are actually important, certainly for EM follow-up, but other more subtle things we may not consider, such as, so for instance, measurements of the Hubble parameter. Um, this means, for instance, you need accurate luminosity distances. You can cross-correlate with galaxy catalogs. You need accurate sky locations as well. Again, things like precession and high multipoles do sort of come into play and help this, but again, it's something we need to take into account. And again, this is a, another subtle thing, source frame masses. And we need these accurate luminosity distances so we can map back to source frame masses to really understand these astrophysical populations. If you start biasing the luminosity distance, you start biasing your so inference of your population and so forth. Uh, and similar things like redshift evolution mm -hmm. and so on. And, and as Patricia also mentioned, we have tests of general relativity. Um, your point particle waveforms are typically a basis for many tests of general relativity. Um, so any discrepancies in your waveform modeling will sort of feed back into your inference um, about violations of general relativity and so forth. So again, you need to understand these systematics before you can make any statements about the validity of general relativity. Um, as I mentioned at the start, a reality check is I feel that there is no detailed or comprehensive understanding of systematics across the parameter space, especially with the current generation model, and we've included more physics than we have before. Um, there is this, this notion that the impact of systematics and gravitational wave observations is implicitly coupled to the underlying population. If we happen to observe binary black holes that are essentially equal mass and non-spinning, this is actually something we can model extremely well. Um, and as sort of Maya alluded to, it seems that the, the binary black holes we're observing actually are relatively low spin, which is great. This is something that's easier to model. Um, but if we start observing, for instance, in binaries that maybe come from a dynamical formation channel, you get more perception, maybe higher mass ratios. This is where you want to have this, this tight control of the waveform systematics. So it is coupled to what sort of events we're observing, but extreme events or... Lost my microphone. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it, it is tied to the underlying population is what I want to say. Um, the other problem we have is that understanding systematics across the parameter space is a high dimensional problem. Both we have the intrinsic parameters to consider, but as I allude to so later, the extrinsic parameters also become important, and the, the binary geometry, for instance, is very relevant. So schematically, I will introduce some of the key wafer models, um, summarize the current accuracy with a, a particular metric, um, and hopefully convince you that the current generation wafer models are all pretty comparable in their performance. I, I will highlight some of the current limitations in the physics that we include, what sort of missing physics there is, and where we think the community is going to go forward in the future. Uh, and then also give sort of an exercise in can we actually understand systematics across the parameter space. So as a brief interlude, um, we obviously are looking at binary black hole wafer models. This is a stereotypical in-spiral merger ring down. Um, so the in-spiral, um, this is where the black holes are sufficiently far apart. You can use perturbative expansions, the Einstein field equations in terms of things like the velocity or the speed of light, so things like Poisson-Tonian expansion. You can resemble it to these nice effective one-body models and so forth. But as the binary in-spirals, uh, the system becomes relativistic. Velocities become comparable to the speed of light. Uh, and this means your perturbative expansions break down. Uh, and this means that we really need to appeal to things like numeric relativity to really capture the late in-spiral and merger. 
Um, and this means you need the NR simulations that really span the parameter space to understand sort of these strong field effects. Uh, and once we then go to the ring down, we can sort of then invoke things like black hole perturbation theory to really understand sort of this, this late stage. So we can do the, the start and the end analytically, uh, but numeric relativity really is crucial in this sort of regime, uh, certainly for comparable mass ratios uh, and so forth. Now, in terms of the, um, the intrinsic parameters, um, I'm really going to be talking about intrinsic parameters that are governed by seven parameters. Uh, for vacuum systems, the total mass is an overall scaling, so we really have the mass ratio and two spin vectors. Um, there are a few different phenomenological features that are, or morphologies that I, I really want to talk about. Um, the first is the, so the non-spinning case, so both black holes have no spin, they just in-spiral and merge. Uh, we can then have a preferential system where the spins are artificially aligned either sort of uh, parallel or anti-parallel to the orbital angular momentum. Uh, and these then, so for instance, impact the in-spiral rate. So you get things like the orbital hang-up, or if they're anti-lined, you get a sort of attractive effect and the in-spiral is quicker. Um, so this is this aligned spin case. And then the other case I'll talk about uh, is where you allow the spins to be misaligned with the orbital angular momentum, and then you get relativistic spin orbit couplings that induce a, a precession of the orbital plane and the spins themselves. The morphology becomes much more dramatic and much more complicated to model. Um, so that's the sort of picture you should have in your mind. So what are the key ways for models and their accuracy? Um, for in-spiral merger ring-down wave models, which is what I'll be talking about here, so I won't consider just, for instance, in-spiral only or ring-down only approximants, uh, we have three main families. Uh, the first is the, the phenomenological wafer models. Um, these are computationally extremely efficient sort of compared to the other ones, in part because they're constructed in the frequency domain directly. Um, so we really model a gravitational wave signal in the frequency domain. Um, and a lot of gravitational wave data analysis operations are natively performed in the frequency domain. Things like, um, as I introduced, the mismatch calculation and inner product in the frequency domain and so forth. Now, the latest generation of phenomenal models um, actually have a, a pretty comparable, or in some parts, better accuracy uh, than EUB against NR or NR surrogates. Um, I will explain some limitations here and where certainly EUB is doing better. Um, but certainly for the alliance spin sector, it's just that our calibration is more recent, for instance. Now, effective one body models, um, they, they incorporate PN information using nice resummations. You have things like pattern resummations, et cetera. And this really improves the accuracy of the in spiral. Um, so there's, there's nice sorts of tricks you can do. Um, that, that really help improve the overall accuracy and help improve the convergence um, beyond just a sort of fixed PN order if you just do a naive Taylor type expansion. These are computation expensive. Um, so uh, this is because you have to solve, for instance, ODs in the time domain and then sort of Fourier transform them um, to do your gravitational data analysis operations. We heard about work uh, to, to mitigate against these costs, such as sort of Scott's talk with the surrogates or Stephen's talks where you sort of do the neural networks uh, sort of in a likelihood free way. So you avoid these sorts of operations in the first place. Um, there's other work such as you can use, uh, for instance, a post adiabatic expansion um, to sort of avoid uh, the computation, computational expense of, of doing the ODEs and so forth. Uh, and I personally believe that these are a much more natural framework to incorporate additional physics. Um, certainly things like self-force information and how it sort of enters the EUB Hamiltonian. Things like scattering information is much more natural in this sort of Hamiltonian framework as well. Uh, and as well as things like precession uh, are much more natural and intuitive in the time domain and the frequency domain where so you sort of have this mixing of scales from the Fourier transform and it becomes a bit more complex and things become a bit more blurred. Uh, and finally, we have numeric relativity surrogates. Um, so these have exquisitely good mismatches against numeric relativity, um, but a caveat for the current generation of surrogates is that they are particularly short. So they're around 4,000 m, so maybe around 20 orbits. Um, and unless you hybridize, then you impose quite severe constraints on the minimum frequency and minimum total mass. So they're not applicable over the entire parameter space. Um, the alliance spin surrogate does have, for instance, hybridization, so there are ways around this, um, but they're also still native to the time domain. Um, so there's still some issues as to whether they scale up in the kind of way you want um, in future gravitational wave observations. Uh, and remember, um, although we're observing tens and you know, to 50 sort of binary black holes at a time now, in the near future, this will scale up to sort of hundreds, and if you want to analyze subthreshold triggers as well, it becomes even more. Um, so the first metric I'm going to introduce is the mismatch. Um, this is the basic object. Um, it's our noise-weighted inner product, so it, it sort of measures essentially agreement or disagreement between two waveform models. Um, because the, the PSD does enter this calculation, it is sensitive to the mass scale. Um, so when you create mismatches, you should really be talking about um, what mass you're sort of referring to. Um, for instance, as you increase the mass of a binary, um, it will sort of shift to lower frequencies. Decrease the mass, it goes to higher frequencies. And, and this just adjusts way sensitive to errors in the waveform model. Um, so the same sort of binary, even if it's equal mass non-spinning, um, the mismatch will sort of vary as you shift around uh, your overall mass. So there's a sort of frequency and mass dependence sort of built in. Um, we can optimize over time in phase shifts. This is just a gauge freedom we can sort of optimize over. And it's just a freedom to choose a, an initial sort of for instance, time of merger for the binary as well as some, uh, initial phase on its orbit. 
Uh, and this is also, this is what we typically call the mismatch. Um, so it's this time and phase optimized sort of inner product, um, sometimes called faithfulness in the literature and so forth. And for processing binaries, we can also optimize over the polarization, so effectively some global type sort of rotation. Uh, typically we do this numerically uh, for convenience. Um, but the key point is these mismatches really allow us to understand the point-wise accuracy of models across the parameter space. Now, then the other nice thing about mismatches is that you can relate this to a sufficient criterion um, in which two waveforms are considered indistinguishable. Uh, and there's sort of a bunch of work on this, and this is sort of the typical formula that one has. Um, so it just is one minus the mismatch, um, or this is typically the mismatch, or one minus the match, if you will. Um, it's related to these two parameters. Obviously, rho is the, the network SNR. Um, D, however, is the number of intrinsic parameters whose measurability is affected by the model inaccuracy. Um, a priori, this isn't precisely known. You can sort of, um, sort of order of magnitude type arguments. You sort of can calibrate this number by performing things like injection recovery campaigns, as was done in this paper by Michael Pura, and I'll show a plot on this in the next slide. Um, but there are some caveats that one should keep in mind. One is that this criterion is conservative, um, so biases can arise if you start violating this sort of um, threshold, but it's not a guarantee. Um, and again, it really depends on where you are in the parameter space. Uh, and likewise, this is really only valid in the highest NAR limit, uh, and there's a bunch of limitations that you'll also see for things like the Fisher matrix of uh, formalism, and uh, you can again go to this paper by Michaela Valisneri um, to see much more information on this. Um, so this is the part I was talking about by, uh, unfortunately, his name's cut off, Michael Perot and Carl Johan Hasta, um, where they looked at, in this case, IMAF from PV2 as a semi-optical waveform model, uh, and looked at things like NR and PN hybrids, uh, and then looked at how, for instance, the mismatch varies um, with the SNR according to this mismatch sort of distinguishability criterion that I showed in the previous slide. So that's exactly what these diagonal lines are showing. Um, some key things that we need to take away from this um, is, is really sort of where we are now. Um, we're sort of approaching this HLVK phase um, where we suddenly see binaries with SNRs in the order of tens. So 10, 20, 30, for instance. In the near future, we'll start seeing things that sort of push up towards SNRs of 100. Uh, and eventually, we'll sort of push towards uh, A plus where we do expect to regularly see um, binaries that have SNRs exceeding 100. Uh, and then obviously in the near future, or the future, if you will, we have the 3G detectors where the SNRs become terrifyingly large um, and perhaps are on the order of 1,000 plus, um, depending on where you are in the parameter space and so forth. Now, based on this distinguishability criterion that I mentioned, a few of the numbers I wanted to sort of take in mind are really sort of here on, on the left-hand side. Um, so when we look at mismatches, if you have a mismatch on the order of 10 to the minus 3, this means we expect that the waveforms to be relatively indistinguishable um, up to, the, I guess, an SNR on the order of a few tens um, up to around 100. Um, so really, it's sort of SNR is less than 100. We think we're safe. Um, if you have mismatches in the order of 10 to the minus 5, for instance, in principle, we think we can sort of go to SNRs um, that are sort of certainly a few hundred, a um, 1,000 at max. But again, this really depends on where you're on the parameter space. But that's, that's, that's what you should have in mind. 10 to the minus 3, a few tens, we probably should be safe. Um, SNR, 10, so mismatch around 10 to the minus 5, um, then a few hundred, we, we think we should be safe. Uh, but I'll quantify this a bit more sort of later on. So the first class of waveform models is phenomenological waveform models. Um, this is perhaps the, the family that I'm most familiar with. Um, the key goal here, as I, as I mentioned, is these accurate and computationally efficient models for the gravitation wave signal itself. So we directly model the strain. Uh, and this essentially represents an extreme compression of information from PN, EOB, black hole perturbation theory, numerical relativity, et cetera, into closed form frequency domain expressions, which is why they're so efficient. Uh, and we again split the waveform into some amplitude uh, and some phase contribution in the, the frequency domain, uh, and this model is mode by mode. Um, so it's actually quite efficient. Um, for things like gain spiral, we just use things like uh, post Antonian approximations. Um, we apply things like the stationary phase approximation. Uh, I'll discuss this limitation a bit later. And then we calibrate um, these higher order pseudo PN coefficients against EUB and R hybrids. Um, so, one of the nice things about Phenom um, is that we actually benefit from any improvements to EUB. We can just go and reconstruct these EUB and R hybrids, recalibrate against this, and we implicitly sort of can improve our model just because EUB has a much better in spiral. Um, so, the, these two models are not necessarily decoupled. Um, and actually, um, working on sort of both EUB and phenomenal models is, is extremely important. The intermediate regime um, is actually just simple polynomial type expressions that we calibrate against numerical relativity. Um, so it's actually very little um, analytical information we have here. Um, there's perhaps some insight you can gain from sort of black hole punches in the extreme mass ratio limit, um, but otherwise, there's not much information that uh, really sort of comes into this stage. It's just calibrated away. Yep. Are these like these curves are like totally fixed and they're parameter? But I mean, is there any notion of uncertainty on the, those 
my logical models themselves. Yeah, there's absolutely some notion of uncertainty. Um, so for these, um, this is just a point in the parameter space. Um, and then for the way the model is constructed is we have certain coefficients that we calibrate, and there is an error associated to these, for instance, calibration sort of coefficients. Um, I haven't shown it here, but you, you can construct these sorts of error bars on, on you know, point-wise around the parameter space. The, the flexibility is not just the parameterizing the, the physics you care about. It's also there's additional parameters that are describing just how well it fits the... Pre precisely. It's, it's precisely that case. Um, one of the things we haven't yet reached the stage of is how we can best incorporate our knowledge of the error, for instance, of the calibration into sort of the data analysis pipelines. Um, but we do kind of sort of lug around a lot of information about the, the uncertainty. Um, we just haven't found a good way to use it yet. Yeah, and, and then finally we have the merge of Ving down. And again, as I mentioned, you just appeal the black hole perturbation theory. So this is something we can actually do pretty reasonably well. Uh, and then we can calibrate against, the, against um, for instance, some of the nonlinear features from the, the sort of early merger, if you will. And we can calibrate that against numerical relativity. Now, the, the schematic approach to constructing the various models um, is essentially the same between all waveform families. Um, we've always focused on the non precession dominant harmonic. It's just much easier to span this parameter space. We have a lot of accurate numerical relativity simulations. Uh, and this gives us phenomenon XAS, which is AS for a line spin. Uh, and this really is just the dominant harmonic. Um, if we then incorporate precession, so if we then model, for instance, the, the time domain, sorry, the, the time dependent rotation of the, the orbital plane and the spins, um, we can have a precession wave for model in the previous domain, phenomenon XP. Uh, or, the, or we can, for instance, first introduce higher multipoles. Um, so we again just model the subdominant spherical harmonic modes, and then you incorporate precession to get a model with precession and higher multipoles. Now, for the non process in 2 2 modes, this was this Phenomex AS model that I mentioned. Um, the accuracy of the mismatches really is around 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4 against these EUB and R hybrids. Um, so, again, as I mentioned, at low masses, you're probing low frequencies, which is really, you're essentially probing the agreement with EUB at the end of the day. Um, whereas at high masses, you really sort of shift towards uh, probing the NR sensitivity of your, your hybrid. So, this is really NR information, this is agreement with EUB information, and things are relatively flat, so that's, that's great. Now, the nice thing is that the mismatches uh, are really clustered around a few times 10 to the minus 5, with a tail that sort of does extend around to around 10 to the minus 3. So for the dominant harmonic, we expect things to be reasonable for pretty large SNRs, maybe on the order of 10 to the 2, a few hundred maybe, depending on where you run the parameter space. But as I mentioned, this is such a parameter space dependent statement. Um, the mismatches up here really come from things like the higher mass ratios, where your analytical information starts to break down quicker and so forth. Um, so you have things like the, the Q18 sort of uh, hybrids up here. Um, and these will become much more distinguishable earlier on than, for instance, something that is a much more comparable mass type system. Yeah, read. Um, so along these lines, the mismatch is a one-dimensional summary statistic that's very useful. Yep. But sort of related to the previous question, is it well known what part of the frequency spectrum the mismatch really kind of goes bad? Right? It, like, is it just a slowly varying function of, like, the mismatch is this inner product. Is uh, the error term sort of slowly varying over frequency, or is it, like, right at the merger and oscillates wildly? Um, I, I guess that's, that's partially answered, I would think, by, by the variation in the mass, which is you're essentially slowly moving the waveform through the bucket, so you're slowly dumping sort of the waveform out. Um, and you can see that, that there is some issues, um, as you sort of tell, so tend to kink up here. So the very early interval is quite good. There's probably some issues maybe with even slightly poor hybridization, or something the transition from your ear and spinal to your numerical relativity waveform, and then it sort of tends to flatten down and become much more accurate as you really set into the NR regime. So I wouldn't say it's quite flat, but there is this, you have a jump from where you have your analytical information breaking down to the NR, which still needs perhaps further modeling, otherwise you expect it to be perfectly flat if the error was uniform. I missed what the, the, the mismatches between, it says WF and NR, sorry, like numerical relativity and the waveform yeah. plus no model. Yeah. Yes, this is just a semi-ethical wave model against numerical relativity. Yeah. Is, are these mismatches over the whole two sphere or just a two two? This is just a two two because it's just a two two. We don't care about the sphere at this point. Uh, I'll go to the high modes sort of in a second, but yeah. So yeah, that's that's that. Um, and again, we can sort of convince ourselves that this is actually doing what we think it's doing by taking nomex, for instance, in the the frequency domain, inverse Fourier transform it, and compare it to our our hybrids with a great self consistency check. Um, and the only answer is once your mismatch is around 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 5, you can't see the difference by eye, um, which is sort of one of the nice things, is that that's how incredibly precise these things are. And this is true even for extreme parts of the parameter space where we have the simulations to really control the model. So here we're at equal mass, rather extreme spins. Um, and you can see that, again, you just can't see the difference between the two curves by eye. You can go to higher mass ratios, negative spins, or a Q18 negative spin, for instance. And, and again, things just look good. 
Um, so that's really the, the level of accuracy we're already at. Um, and the fact that, for instance, mismatches so tend to go down to 10 to minus 3, and this will be a problem for us, just tells us what sort of exquisite accuracy we need in these waveform models. Now this comes back to Lorena's question, is now if we include precession in higher modes, um, we certainly have to include, for instance, uh, the fact that we have the whole two-sphere. Um, uh, so we do become sensitive to binary geometry. We have to optimize over the polarization as well. Um, so mismatches I show here are a, a bit naive in the sense that all I do is optimize over time. Uh, phase and polarization shifts, but I generate a random sample of mismatches, sort of for different parameters, different inclinations, um, and that sort of thing. So there, there is a, implicitly a mass scale sort of thrown in here as well. Um, it's just different random binaries and different masses. Now, the first thing I want you to look at are the, the blue and the green curves, so histograms, sorry. Um, and these are the NR surrogate, and so what we think has extremely good mismatches against the numerical relativity data. I'm using Phenomix PHM, so precession and high multipoles, but with two different prescriptions for the precession dynamics. So this is another nice game we can play. We're looking at waveform systematics by taking the same model and just changing, in a modular sense, the physics that we include. Um, but unfortunately, we find, or fortunately, we find that actually the precession prescription isn't a major source of error in this waveform model. So we know that the error sort of comes from perhaps different aspects or, or different parts of the model. Um, if we then look at sort of the red one, um, this is a previous generation of Fanon model against the NR surrogate, and we see the mismatches are again around 10 to minus 2 and, and sort of further down. Uh, and this is perhaps a, a nice overview um, as to how much we have gained by improving the calibration uh, of Fanon MX in this sense. Um, so the reality is that the, the perception prescription hasn't changed between um, PV3HM and XPHM here in green, um, but the underlying calibration has. So even by just improving the underlying baseline model, you significantly improve the mismatches by an order of magnitude or more. Um, and then the orange is just a, a demonstration of where we think we stand in terms of the line spin sector. Um, so it's how much do we lose by going, uh, by incorporating precession. And we see that the, the orange is sort of around here, tail up to around 10 to the minus 2 max, whereas the precession sector is around 10 to the minus 1 max. There's about an order of magnitude discrepancy between our line spin understanding and uh, the precession high multiple waveform models. Um, and I guess coming back to so the, the distinguishability criterion, uh, mismatches around 10 to the minus 3, I guess, for the bulk of the waveforms, this means that we think we should be safe for SNRs in the order of a few tens, and maybe up to 100 if we're lucky in the parameter space. But again, the reality is this really depends on where you are in the parameter space. Um, and for instance, if we have mismatches around 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, we're, we're going to be in problems if we have a loud binary or even a binary that's around 10, 20 SNR. Um, the other thing that sort of comes back into this is that where these sort of break down uh, in the parameter space isn't uniform. Uh, where we tend to see mismatches degrading the worst is especially high spins. Um, and this means that there's already a preferential selection for binaries that have perhaps lower spins, maybe sort of some safety net here as well. Um, so this comes back to you've got to understand what population you're observing compared to um, training over the whole parameter space available. So now I'm going to talk about the effective one body models. Um, so in effective one body, in a, in a nutshell, we replace the two body dynamics with the dynamics of some test particle with some reduced mass mu, um, moving in some effective metric. Um, so here we deform the metric to include extra physics. So we have a deform short space spacetime or a deform curve spacetime. You can construct your effective sort of reduced Hamiltonians, et cetera. And because you have a nice Hamiltonian, you do what you do with all Hamiltonians. You sort of write down Hamilton's equations and you solve an equation of motion. So you sort of, for instance, like solve the GD's motion of this particle um, in this deformed spacetime. Um, and this allows you to generate both the dynamics um, as well as the EUB waveform itself. Uh, and this is something that's actually really quite powerful in EUB. You do get both. Uh, and this is why you'll often hear people say that EUB is in some sense more fundamental, uh, and that's certainly a notion that I would agree with, um, because you do have um, both things implicitly. Now again, uh, the structure to EUB waveforms uh, really sort of mirrors um, the same thing we do in Phenom as well. Um, and this is just that all waveform models are, are really constructed in the same sort of way, so this prescription should be familiar. You first model a dominant harmonic, the first thing we can do extremely well. You can then incorporate precession, so a time-dependent uh, sort of motion of the orbital plane and the spins. Or you can add mu high multipoles, um, so to get the higher modes into the waveform model, and then incorporate precession. Um, the difference is that EOB is natively done in the time domain. Um, there's actually two main families of uh, EUB models, um, and this is important. I won't necessarily go through the slide and, and what's in this. Um, obviously, so Rosella can, may mention some more about this, and I hope she should, certainly does. Um, but there's certainly references you can look at offline, just to mention that there's different choices for the Hamiltonian. There's different gauges that are used in the Hamiltonians. There's different choice of calibration. Um, there's different physics that enter. Um, so there's a, a lot of freedom as to, for instance, the things you can include. For instance, things like even spin orbit couplings differ between the models. You have different gyro electromagnetic ratios that enter these models and so forth. Um, but let's just jump straight to the, the mismatches, our precession and higher modes. Um, 
This is for fixed inclinations. So we don't have random inclinations, we just have a fixed inclination. Um, so this is sort of pi over three, so it's not quite face-on, it's not quite edge-on, but again, high mode should be relevant. The first curve is this thin orange curve. Um, this is just the dominant harmonic from numerical relativity uh, against the dominant harmonic from SNMR V4P. So it's still processing, but just a 2-2 mode. Uh, and what you see is that mismatches is sort of again around a few times 10 to the minus three, sort of brought in 10 to the minus two. Um, but if you include, for instance, all the multipoles in numerical relativity, but only model the dominant harmonic, uh, you suddenly find that you get this thicker orange line and the mismatches suddenly degrade around 10 to the minus two um, and push up against 10 to the minus one quite sharply. This is a nice thing to sort of show because it says that if we miss physics, in this case, if we miss modeling the higher multipoles, um, we actually start to impact um, the mismatches quite dramatically. Whereas if we include all multipoles, we suddenly get the blue curve uh, where there is a significant agreement between NR and SUV 4 phm and the mismatches drop down to again to a few times 10 to minus three, around 10 to minus two. The, yeah, fun. Sorry to interrupt. Um, when you mentioned you're fixing the inclination here, you are varying the assignment angle of, of your, let's say, reference wave from your SUV and R in this case. Yeah. And then for each of these assignments, let's say for fixed parameters and inclination, you're optimizing over the phase for each of those individual inclinations. Yeah, I think that's right. That's unphysical. Principle one should do is I have here my uh, source is given mass ratios and spins, or given inclination, let's say it's on. And then I, I have the same system calculated with SUV and, and on. And then I, what I have to do is to do a single phase shift, single assignment phase shift to reconcile the two systems as good as I can. And then that's, free, that's what's frozen. If I understood correctly, what you're doing is for each of these orientations, you're doing like a different rotation on your. Secondary no, so I think it is the, the first one you mentioned. So yeah, th there is a certain order of precedence when you do these operations, and I think it is, I, I think it is fine. I'll think about that, but I think the way we do it is, is correct because, you, as you said, you, you have the freedom to align them first. It's similar when you construct hybrids; you align them, for instance, in this co-processing frame, and then you can perform some global rotation to put it back in the right frame at a fixed time. Right, then you cannot just do a, a, a case optimization for each one of your. Precisely, yeah, precisely, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, the key takeaway message is that even for SUMRV for PHM, um, actually things are pretty much similar in terms of mismatches to Phenom. Uh, and we see this as well. This is sort of work, uh, unfortunately, to cut off again by Rosella Gamba. I won't talk about it too much because um, maybe Rosella talks about it. Just to show again that the, the TOB RISMS and IMR Phenom XPHM have actually pretty similar agreement. Um, so the mismatches are again similar ballpark. So I hope that that is some convincing that actually between all the way from models that we currently employ, I guess the performance is pretty similar. So let's quickly mention numerical relativity and surrogates. Um, I won't go through this slide, uh, just to mention that there are different finite, sort of different codes to produce numerical relativity data. We have, the, for instance, finite difference codes such as BAM and the Einstein Toolkit. We have special codes such as SPEC. There's all sorts of different choices that go into this, whether it's the, the formulation of the Einstein equations, choice of initial data, choice of numerics, et cetera. So you can look at this offline. Just to be aware that um, we do have different numerical relativity codes, so understanding the discrepancies between the two codes is actually quite important. Um, well, I must, uh, Public, sort of one of the largest sort of releases of numerical relativity simulations is this public SXS catalog, so around 2018 waveforms. Um, but a, a key takeaway message is really sort of this, this plot down here. Um, for mass ratios above four, we still have a depletion of numerical relativity simulations. And this is something that plagues the field generally. Um, since you go above mass ratio four, there's just a, a depletion of accurate, long, um, especially high spin numerical relativity simulations. And this does start to impact the validity of your, your models in these regions of the parameter space. Uh, and I hope you can see that this means that we really should start trusting the models less um, in regions where we can't validate them. Um, NR as well is not free from systematics. Um, this is something that people sometimes seem or like to neglect. Um, NR itself does have a lot of errors that come sort of built into it. Um, there could be all sorts of reasons, either poor numerics, poor gauge conditions, boundary conditions, you name it. Um, and this can lead to bogus mismatches against the waveform model, but it's not meaningful. We need to look at both the semi-lexical wave models against, as well as the, the numerical relativity data itself in order to validate it in a meaningful sense. Um, a, good thing, a good example here is for the higher mode, the 4-4 mode. Um, here we're comparing EUB uh, against numerical relativity, and you see that there's some unphysical features here. This doesn't mean that the, the semi-lexical wave model is wrong, uh, and the mismatch will be particularly bad for this mode. It just means that there's some issue that we should be aware of. So data quality is a significant issue, especially in the, the higher multipole error. And uh, it's something that we're getting a much better understanding of as we go along. So unphysical behavior is present in numerical relativity data. It's not free from systematics. <laughs>
Likewise, subtle things such as even extrapolation of waveforms to future null infinity can introduce on physical features. Um, we see that here where we compare different extrapolation orders in, for instance, success data, uh, and you see that it does introduce some shifts. You have to have a lot of care as to which extrapolation order you're using in different parts of the parameter space and, and in the waveform model itself. You can mitigate this by looking at things like Cauchy characteristic extrapolation. This can help reduce near-zone and gauge effects. Um, but again, it's just something you should be aware of uh, when you do waveform modeling. Um, so for instance, you use, yeah, read. I was just going to say, don't those effects get clobbered by the PSD? Is there like a DC offset? Um, There's some rise time, right, that'll be higher frequencies, but like both. I guess it comes back to these sorts of issues as well, is if you try to calibrate against these sorts of sort of offsets and these, these drifts, you're going to have a, a pretty bogus calibration, and this can start to deform your model in ways you don't expect. And for things like 1905-21, which is pure merger ringdown, this is the kind of effect you, you don't want to be occurring in your waveform model. Because the calibration is happening outside of the mismatch calibration. Yeah. So it doesn't know anything about this. Yeah, precisely. Um, and likewise, you also have things like choice of frames. Um, so there's a, been a lot of work to understand and mitigate these effects. Um, for instance, we can fix the Poincare frame. Um, in this case, it was mapping to the center of mass to account for center of mass drifts. And this was this work by sort of Mike Boyle and, and co. And there's been a much more recent understanding as to the fact that we should be using Poincare charges and super transition charges to fix the BMS frames. This is this work by Keith Mittman. It was the work by Lorena as well, as she discussed earlier in the workshop. Uh, and this can introduce some uh, subtle features, especially for things like the higher modes. So it's again, it's another systematic we should be aware of should really be accounting for. Now, uh, as I mentioned, um, the surrogates, um, as was sort of discussed in Scott's talk on reduced order modeling, um, can essentially reproduce your input data. So there's no approximations in terms of physics you neglect. You reproduce what you put in. As I just mentioned, NR is systematic, so some care and caution should be applied. The model accuracy is in principle equivalent to your NR accuracy. Um, caveats, you need a lot of simulations. So for the persistent surrogate, you need thousands of simulations. This is extremely competition expensive to generate the training set in the first place. You are limited by your input data. As I mentioned, the finite duration, finite mass ratio, finite spins. Um, and there is some notion of a strategy to form high dimensional fits in the parameter space and whether it scales to longer waveforms, um, uh, much broader mass ratios and spins and so forth. But this is work that is sort of, I've uh, been a study of investigation and really is of interest. To go to the mismatches again, um, we do find that the NR surrogates, at least in the, their domain of validity, um, so this is mass ratio of four spins plus or minus 0 0.8, um, are reproducing the, the NR data uh, with mismatches in the order of 10 to the minus four, or a few times 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus three. So it's perhaps about an order of magnitude better than the, the current generation of models. It's just that they are limited in their, their domain of validity. Um, so that, that's what we want to take away from here. Where we can use the NR surrogate, it's great. Um, caveats should be understood, systematics should be understood. Uh, and as you see from even the NR sort of mismatches, this is the highest resolution against the lower resolution. You do find that there is a tail that even extends to 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 3, which is where we start to have the, the error in our semi-analytical waveform models. So caution does need to be applied. So let's quickly move on to what physics is missing from our waveform models. Um, as I mentioned, there is a depletion of these high mass ratio, high spin simulations, especially long durations. We capture a lot of the, the breakdown of the analytical models. Um, this does impact the, the validity of your semi-analytical waveform models. You can try to use test particle information, but there's caveats uh, on using this. Um, for instance, the, the choice of the in-spiral, et cetera, but I, I won't go into detail on that. Um, things like processing waveform models. Um, we tend to construct these following the work of, of Patricia, actually. Um, and this introduces, actually, two key identifications. The first is that processing binaries can be simplified significantly by transforming to a frame that tracks the orbital plane. Uh, so in the left plot, we have a, a co-processing uh, sort of waveform modes for a, a genuine processing binary. And in the right, we have some equivalent aligned spin binary. And because we put it into some optimal frame, you suddenly see that the, the, the mode hierarchy is sitting in much better agreement, and the modes are conceptually quite similar. And there's a few sort of oscillations of physical features that are present in this waveform, but not this one. Um, but the, the key identification was that we can approximate the co-processing modes um, with some equivalent aligned spin modes. Um, this is something we can model extremely well. So this is a quick strategy and a quick route to construct and processing waveform model. So we factorize this into more than a time-dependent rotation, so these, these Euler angles or quaternions, um, whatever your preference is, and then modeling the waveforms in some preferred frame. Caveats, um, there are limitations. When you map to non-processing modes, you do neglect genuine physics. As I mentioned, there are these oscillations that we neglect. You neglect things like precession-induced mode asymmetries, et cetera, so we're dumping physics to make the problem simpler. Likewise, um, the final mass and spin between the non-processing and processing approximants is not the same, and so we do need to modify our aligned spin waveform models with some sort of fudge, if you will, to really capture the final remnant. Uh, and you need to describe the precession angles, this time-dependent rotation. Unfortunately, post-Antonian theory breaks down, so you really want to do things like calibrate against numerical relativity, 
But as I've already mentioned, um, there's a depletion of numerical relativity simulations, especially beyond Q4. Um, so this sort of strategy becomes somewhat difficult. But the first attempt was sort of um, presented by this work by Eleanor Hamilton. And that's exactly what we see, um, is you do see this dephasing in the precession angles with respect to numerical relativity data. Um, and this is also shown sort of in this plot on the right-hand side, um, where the NR data is in black, and then various sort of semi-optical wafer models are in the different colors. Um, but just to state that, Session angles uh, is something that is difficult to model. Um, caution does need to be applied, uh, and certainly is something that we know is a, a deficiency in current models, and it's something that we're actively working to improve. Um, as I mentioned, the final state is important, especially for things like 1905-21. You really want to understand your merger ring down sort of properties. Um, this means an accurate model for things like causal mode structure, um, especially in, in context of higher modes and precession. Um, the modified final state is more difficult in the fixed domain than time domain. Um, simple reasons such as um, EOB gives you the spin evolution. This means you can get the spin orientations of the merger much more correct. This is relevant because this determines the geometry of the merger uh, and can lead to nice sort of physical effects such as superquicks, um, which is dependent on how you rotate the spins in the plane, et cetera. Um, so these are sort of subtle features that do become important because it does affect the, the merger being done waveform. You also are usually predicated on accurate fits of radiated energy and final spin. These are calibrated against numerical relativity. Um, and this is the typical error bars we're at now, so, so around 10 to minus 3 level. This is true whether you use EUB or phenom. You all map to an NR calibrated fit, um, whereas the, you have things like the surrogate model, which does sort of push the errors down to around 10 to minus 5, but again, it's a domain of validity question. Um, so typically, both EUB and phenom end up uh, essentially introducing some uh, augmentation to the non-processing fit calibrated against numerical relativity with some processing type correction. So this is something we know we need to improve. Stationary phase approximation um, is obviously something that is used to convert uh, from the time domain to fixed domain and phenomenal models. Um, the certain formal criteria under which this stationary phase approximation is valid. Um, essentially, at the end of the day, a highly oscillatory Fourier transform will only have support that's centered on the point of stationary phase, and this allows us to write down the fixed domain waveform from the time domain waveform. However, at late in spiral and merger, the SBA is not valid. A person tone theory breaks down, SBA breaks down. Um, there's some notion of can we just naively calibrate this away? Um, which is just if you sort of calibrate against numerical relativity, you don't care that SPA is breaking down because you sort of smoothly transition to reproduce the Fourier transformed NR data in the first place. This becomes particularly problematic for things like um, precession and extracity and emeries because you have non monotonic frequencies. And where this really hits you is you have multiple solutions um, to the stationary phase criterion. Uh, and in particular, when uh, this is changing sign, omega delta zero, so your stationary phase approximation has a singularity, um, so the whole thing breaks down. You can mitigate this in known methods, such as shifted uniform asymptotics. You can look at things like higher order corrections, um, and this is something that work is, so we are working towards. Um, or you can just look at things like time domain models, which actually don't suffer from the SBA in the first place. So a quick summary, um, based on sort of what I just said above. Um, we need high mass ratio and high spin NR data. The precession angles will break down at merger, so we need to calibrate the numerical relativity. Um, SPA is a problem for frequency domain models. We know that. We're working to overcome that. Um, final state is sensitive to uh, spin orientations and our, and our fits. Um, so high processing system is problematic. And likewise, we approximate processing modes with some modified aligned spin modes. This is true for all wafer models. So we expect high mass ratio, highly processing binaries to be the most problematic. So can we understand systematics across the parameter space? Um, the answer is yes. Um, we can at least get a lot of insight. Intrinsic parameters are important, but parameter geometry is also important. Um, in a nutshell, high multiples are excited by any asymmetry in the binary, be it mass asymmetry or spin asymmetry. Um, and this means we get, for instance, um, some suppression of the odd M modes, um, so like, for instance, two on, so this, this two on here with this delta M terms, so this is M1 minus M2 or the 3, 3. Um, but they can get excited by things like spin asymmetry, um, and that's because of these sorts of couplings here of the asymmetric spin contributions of delta M's, and that's sort of shown in the part on the right-hand side. So asymmetry in the binary excites higher modes. Um, but there's also another factor that sort of comes into play, and it sort of comes back to the question Lorena asked as well, which is high multiples are subject to geometric suppression. There's a spin-weighted spherical harmonic that enters how they enter the strain, um, and this means that we do need to take into account the relative orientation, so not all binaries are created equally in terms of a gravitational wave observation. If we end up looking sort of essentially face-on, so straight down sort of the, the orbital angular momentum, or the total angular momentum, whatever, um, then we're dominated by the 2-2. Um, so having just an accurate 2-2 mode is something that's going to save us, and the other multiples sort of tend to get suppressed. Whereas if we go to an edge-on system, which is sort of much more inclined, we suddenly start minimizing the 2-2, the mode we can actually do the best, and we suddenly start having to worry about our accuracy of our high multiple wave, sort of high multiple waveform modes. Um, so this means that binary geometry is important. 
Um, and you can see this sort of, if you look at this, sort of this plot here, in the top you have an inclination of zero, so dominated by two, two. Um, and this is against NR with all the waveform sort of modes. Things look fantastic. But as you go to more extreme inclination angles, the two to only model is just completely discrepant. Whereas once you include higher waveform modes in your sort of model, you can start to reconstruct the sort of NR data meaningfully. Um, so accurate modeling of high is important, but it is much more challenging. Data quality issues, um, analytic information is not quite as, as ready and so forth. Um, so what should we expect based on everything I've discussed before? Um, so as I just mentioned, volume high multiples is not as advanced, so edge run configurations will be challenging, um, especially uh, parts of parent space as well that are high mass ratio and have much more uh, asymmetry in the system. We do use significant approximations in the persistent sector, as I've discussed, so highly persistent binary is challenging. PN will break down as you go to higher mass ratio. Um, this means that it's just more challenging to go to push towards sort of Q8, Q18, and so forth. Um, and then again, depletion of NR simulations. So high mass ratios, high spins, challenging. So now we can go and check this. Um, so I generated a bunch of mismatches from XBHM against the NR surrogate during the coffee breaks. And we again sort of reproduced this curve that I showed earlier. That's great. Um, but what I have sort of squished into here is the fact that there's various inclinations, um, various orientations, various masses, spins, et cetera. So now we can just pot the data, but looking at different sort of projections in the parameter space. So, um, so here I'm looking at the match, not the mismatch. Um, so a match of one is great, a match of zero is awful. Um, and here I'm just plotting against the inclination. So this is for face on, the binary sort of beaming sort of radiation towards us. Face on, binary sort of beams uh, radiation sort of away. Um, and inclination edge on is, is where you're sort of essentially looking into the orbital plane. Um, and we see something that's quite unsurprising, which is that for edge on and edge off configurations, we actually do an extremely good job. Um, but as we go towards edge on, there's suddenly a dramatic reduction um, in the mismatches, precisely because we minimize the two tumors and high multiples uh, are becoming much more important. Um, we also have this mass ratio dependence. So in blue, we have um, comparable mass ratio systems. Again, something we're doing quite well. Um, but as we go towards sort of Q4 and high mass ratios, um, we do see a degradation in mismatches. Um, so this is sort of the intuition at play, if you will. Same thing if we look at processions, we can look at sort of Chi-P, so that's this work by Patricia, and we find as we increase the amount of procession in the system, we do have a systematic drift towards high mismatches, so um, we, we do expect these to become more problematic in the observations. And again, you have this mass ratio dependence. All the blue systems down here are comparable mass ratio, but you can push up to um, asymmetric systems and suddenly find that the mismatches are degrading quite, quite dramatically. Um, so we know the directions in the parameter space where errors are sort of exploding the quickest. Um, for chi-effective, um, things are a bit more optimistic in the sense that as we vary sort of chi-effective, um, things are actually much flatter. It's much more of a mass ratio sort of dependent statement here. And this is sort of coupled to the other dimensions as well. So this does include, for instance, process and stuff as well. It's not a, a, just a shift in chi-effective. There's, there's everything else built in. Um, but this is partly because we can model the in-spiral rate and the, the line spin sector much better than the process and sector in general. Um, so now we can look at some quick sort of parameter estimation studies. Um, this again comes back to Bayesian inference. What we're interested in here is really the likelihood, uh, maybe the evidence if you want to do things like model selection, but really the likelihood. So we're looking at the difference between different wave models and how they describe the data. Uh, as I mentioned, this is computation expensive. It's a high dimensional parameter space. So there's only limited studies that we can realistically do uh, in a lifetime. Um, we can either run targeted campaigns to quantify systematics and golden or interesting events such as 1905-21. Or we can form systematic investigations to study trends in measurability and biases and so forth. So for 59.14, um, we did this exhaustive NR injection campaign um, where we used different NR wave models to directly compare to the data. Takeaway message was that there was no evidence of systematic bias relative to statistical errors due to waveform modeling. Um, but for higher SNR signals, regions of parameter space disfavored by the data, um, systematics were irrelevant. Um, and unsurprisingly, it's the usual suspects. The lower masses, the larger mass ratios, High spins and edge on configurations were inducing quite significant biases. Um, so if you look at the plot on the right, um, here we're looking at Chi-P. Um, these dashed lines are edge on configurations or edge on injections. Sod lines are face on injections. Face on agrees with the data extremely well. Significant biases for these edge on configurations. Um, something like 1904-12 was also an interesting event. This was relatively loud, SNR-19. Um, asymmetric binary CQ around three. Um, we can run different multiple waveforms on this. Um, and so look at the waveform systematics. This is similar to the plot Patricia showed. Um, we do see broad agreement, um, and we can also have some intuition as to why we start seeing these discrepancies. It is in a region of the parameter space where systematics are thought to be mild, um, especially in the sense that spin precession is actually quite small. So here, Chi-P is around 0.2, um, and inclination was actually, it was away from face on, but it's still relatively mild uh, in any sense. So it was really peaking around 0.5. Um, so we already do see discrepancies between the different waveform models, especially in modeling precession. 
Uh, things like modeling effective line spin, much better agreement, um, and again, some side shifts in things like component masses and so forth. Um, it's also a great example of how additional physics impacts PE. Um, so for instance, because it's an asymmetric binary, higher modes are relevant, uh, and these do help break things like the inclination distance degeneracies, which is great for things like cosmology and measuring the Hubble parameter. So here we can uh, blue against the dashed line. We see that once you include the higher multipoles, your inclination distance is, is much better localized. Once you include precession, you also help break mass spin degeneracies as well. Uh, and this means you get even tighter posteriors. So missing physics will broaden your posteriors and induce shifts and sort of slight biases. But once you start including and modeling this physics, you can get much tighter measurements on the various parameters um, caveated on systematics. There's also this nice study by, by Tusif um, highlighting the role of different approximations within the NR surrogate. Um, the first one is the relevance for higher modes. You can just include different higher mode content and run parameter estimation. You find, again, that the, that the L equals two mode is, is biased, um, but the uh, higher multiples, so again, are in pretty good agreement. So once you include L equals three and L equals four modes, that there's no discrepancy. So it seems like going from L equals two to L equals three is important, um, not quite so important beyond that for this particular binary. Uh, and likewise, um, you can play around with the NR surrogate to test different approximations that are typically used in our waveform models, such as you can ignore mode asymmetries in the co-processing frame, um, or you can impose that the co-processing waveform modes are equivalent to some line spin configuration. Uh, and what we find is that for this binary, um, these approximations are not a dominant source of error. So it's actually the, the differences between the waveform models and their intrinsic, for instance, calibration and modeling um, that is a, a bit more important in this case. Um, the other thing is that, obviously, if you run on a true event, we don't actually know what the true parameters are for that event. Um, this is an unknown source. We don't know which of the waveform models is necessarily correct. You can look at things like base factors to help sort of gauge intuition. Or you can also quantify systematics by injecting and recovering um, through some synthetic signals. So here we have NR, phenom, UB or something. So here we can form an NR injection, we cover the phenom XPHM, and we find that actually we, we get pretty broad agreement. Again, we think systematics should be quite mild. Um, or we can inject with SUBR V4 PHM and recover the phenom XPHM. Um, and we do see that there are, again, some, some slight shifts and some slight differences, but again, systematics relatively mild. But it's a way to do controlled systematic studies, and that's all I really want to flag up. Um, the last sort of topic is NSPH-like binaries. Um, can we understand how missing physics impacts parameter estimation? Again, yes, you do, you do a systematic study. Um, so here we inject smrv 4 phm and recover with IMR phenom D, so an older generation of phenom model that's non-processing, and IMR phenom PV2, the, the older generation processing equivalent. Um, key takeaway message is that if, for instance, you use only the, the aligned spin sort of wafer model, um, that's these dashed lines, then you find that as you increase the amount of precession in the system, um, you start to dramatically mischaracterize the component masses. So the, the heavier sort of object becomes even heavier. But your lighter object, which in principle is, is around 2.75, so above your neutron star mass, suddenly gets push, pushed down to around 1.75, something that's much more compatible with the neutron star mass. Um, so this just means that if you start to neglect physics in NSPH binaries, you can start to really mischaracterize these, uh, and this really blows the boundaries between a black hole and a neutron star. This is particularly pertinent because some of the current generation NSPH models only model aligned spin 2 2 modes um, for NSPHs. So, this is a, certainly an area which the point particle phasing, which is all I've done here, will be significant. So, we really need to control this for these NSPH binaries. Um, otherwise, we are going to sort of suffer from these sorts of uh, effects. Um, and this then just ties us back to the product I showed at the start. Um, which is we're now sort of now pushing down into this regime where we're sort of in the purple territory with our current generation of wafer models. Um, and this is sort of really sort of gearing us up in preparation for, you know, uh, 05 and 8 plus and beyond. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, there are improvements to wafer models in the pipeline. But we think we're sort of in the right direction to sort of hopefully keep pace with, with how the detectors are improving. Um, it's just that the rate at which the detectors are improving is, is rather scary. Um, so certainly there's a, a lot of different aspects across the field, whether it's NR waveforms, phonological waveforms, Poisson-Turian modeling, um, even modeling things like extreme mass ratios can help inform um, the comparable mass ratio, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of work across the board. Um, so yeah, that, that's all I really want to you know, say, is highly persistent binaries, high mass ratios, and binary geometry all play uh, an important role. Thank you.